greetings there and welcome along to another little short Al's Geek Lab. Um, today I wanted to show you something I just found out. I was, I, I'm kind of blown away by it. I just found out um, about it. Um, I don't know why I'm blown away by it, but it, it's pretty cool nonetheless. I've got a whole bunch of um, old retro applications and if you're anything like me, they predate the 64-bit uh, era. Um, sometimes they predate the 32-bit era. In fact, they're on 16-bit. Um, now, if they are MS-DOS applications, that's easy to solve. You you use something like DOSBox, or you can run VirtualBox, and you can run these old operating systems within a virtual a VM environment. But what if you wanted them to kind of behave like they were pretty much native applications? Running 16-bit Windows applications on Windows 8, 10, and now 11 as well is pretty difficult. Most of the time it's hit or miss or they will just not work at all. The 16-bit Windows applications really were never designed to run on a even a 32-bit arguably, but definitely 64-bit uh, Wintel platform uh, running Windows 10 or 8. Why, why you'd run still, why we'd run eight, I do not know. If you're running eight, stop watching this video and, run and upgrade, please. Um, and uh, yeah, and also Windows 11. Anyway, enough of my nonsense. Um, I was just advised by one of our YouTubers, um, a user called Storm Driving, um, that you can run this thing called Wine VDM to run 16 bit applications. I thought I'll Google that because I have never heard of it. The the word wine um, obviously sounds a lot like um, wine is not an emulator, which is a well-known sort of virtual environment um, in, in the Linux world. So this thing here is on GitHub, as you can see. So um, github.com forward slash ocha128 wine VDM. That anyway, if I scroll down, it shows you what it is. I mean, here's a you know, real old school 16 bit application, it's a calculator running um, with what appears to be a Windows 10 style widget um, or a, a window manager kind of look. And you can see it says there what it says on the 10 16 bit Windows applications running on 64 bit Windows. Um, which uh, it says it's an altered version of Wine EVDM, a uh, 16-bit Windows emulator ported to 64-bit Windows. So I am familiar with Wine, um, and it does work pretty well, but I always used to use Wine in Linux to run Windows-based applications. And when I say it runs pretty well, I would say about oh, maybe half of the apps that I wanted to run, the Windows apps, if they were fairly stock standard Windows apps, if I wanted them to run, they would run. But there's also, um, you know, it brought my curiosity are Windows 1 applications, Windows 2 applications. I don't really use a lot of those. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up um, a first try attempt. So I've got a folder of uh, Windows version 2, literally the Windows version 2. So that's it's all extracted into this folder. So these are the application files that came with Windows 2.0, um, which is very much 16-bit. So this is pre-Windows 3, of course. Um, and if you tried to open these under normal circumstances, they, I'm pretty sure they would never work. Um, but sure enough, look at that. Look at that groovy little calculator. Um, and if I go to About Calculator, Microsoft Windows Calculator version 2.03. Um, and it's, you know, it, it operates just just fine. You can see that the um, the mouse cursor is even changing. You know, that's that's crazy. Um, and and yes, yeah, so, so simple applications like that. So far, I've had no problems with getting to work. So there's a calendar. Um, and I literally, as you can see, it's as simple as pressing open and, and they open. Um, Wine is obviously running in the background or some sort of um wine is running in the background and you can see it's pointing out here the build module type is not windows or windows 386 um well i mean i guess yeah it is it's windows 2 which is windows 16 um so that was not win 386 win 386 was um i think it was uh windows 3.4 or maybe 
even 3.1. So anyway, yeah, it's all these old applications that came. There's card file. I actually never used card file. Look at that fixed sys font. Whoa. Um, but yeah, and it's bring it. In fact, and that you could see that there. If I just uh, yeah, I put some data and I went to exit it. Oh, cute. I went to exit and it said it popped up another dialogue saying, "Do you want to save changes?" Um, which looks almost like a you know a Windows 10 style dialogue. So you know there's some sort of cross integration in in the world in the environment here. So it's working. Um, it's working pretty well. Um, you can even run the control panel here. <laughs> that was the limitation. That was it. That was the control panel. So if you compare that to you know your Windows 10 control panel, um, there's uh, there's quite a lot of changes <laughs> in the world since then. So anyway, um, so I thought I'd show you that. Um, there's obviously um, plenty more uh, uses for it. Now, um, I what I want to do is I want to see if I can install the Windows 3.5. So Windows 3.5 was NT, by the way. It was an early version. I think it was a 16-bit version. It might even have been 64-bit. But um, I want to see if I can spin this up um, with um, a Windows an early Windows NT application, and I want to run Microsoft Word. So that means going through the installer process. So I haven't actually installed it yet, but what I did do is I preempted this. Um, if you can see here, there's my uh, home directory in in Windows. This is at the the command prompt. I just you know ran cmd here and went in, and you can see I've created. There's there's a virtual C drive, um, which is in the directory that you installed OTVDM into. And I've created two files in there, which are completely empty, by the way, autoexec and config sys. And I did that because um, when I went to run this, and I haven't run it all the way through, but I went and noticed that there was an error in the console saying that those two files did not exist. And it sort of hung there. Um, so I in, I've created those files, and now I want to see if it does work. And that's literally as far as I got. So this might feel miserably, but I really wanted to get Microsoft Word um, version six for Windows uh, installed on this machine. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I, I write a lot of my scripts for Owl's Geek Lab videos on um, on um, my, my machine behind me, my old DOS machine, which is running Word for DOS version 6. And uh, the two will happily talk all day. You can read Windows and DOS version 6. But if you take a MS-DOS version 6 um, Word doc and try and open it with any newer version of Windows, uh, Word for Windows, uh, pretty much, I think even 95 won't even open them. They just, they just don't know what they are. Um, so that's pretty horrible. I don't know why Microsoft decided to drop uh, support for all of their DOS versions so quickly on in, in the lifetime of Microsoft Word. But at least if I can get this installed, that would be a cool thing. And um, yeah, so I'm going to go for that. Um, so you, all you can see there is I went to run the setup. So this will go through the whole setup process. There's no, uh, this is a pretty normal style Windows installation um, process. This is a bit more fully fledged than what I was doing before, which is just running single 16-bit executables. I think this might even be a 32-bit executable, but I'm not sure. Anyway, press OK. Let's have a look and see if um, it uh, seems to know who I am for some reason. That's, that's scary. And yeah, so this is where it hung before, and it came up and said, oh, there you go. Um, that's the DOS console, by the way. Um, Good, I'll just leave that down there so I can see if there's any errors. Uh, my serial number, all right, cool. Um, and we'll see what happens. Okay, uh, copy to C colon one word. Yeah, I'll have that, thank you very much. Now it's having a little look around for uh, installed components. 
I don't actually know what it's doing right now. It, um, it's, it certainly takes a long time. It's certainly not um, processing stuff or, or, or maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's looking through my entire C drive right now to see if it's there's other installed components. I, that would be kind of weird, but I've got a feeling that it, the limitation to the environment that it knows about is actually the C drive, which is presented to it by um, OTVDM, which is you know this, um, this this virtual C drive, which has got literally nothing in it. Um, but hey, you never know. Maybe maybe it does. So after what seemed like an absolute eternity, the uh, the application eventually came back into life. It sort of went into a sort of confused state. It just seemed in a, a loop uh, for a very long time. And um, I noticed every now and again, it would complain about config sys in some way, shape or form. Um, it was looking for config sys. So I put config sys both in the C, the real C colon root, um, which I needed admin privileges to run notepad for, um, and just left it as an empty config sys so the file exists. But I also put one in the virtual directory there. But even though they exist, it still, still gives this error about, uh, you know, I'm assuming, well, I don't know, actually. I, I don't know what it means. But basically, there's some problem with the fact that there's config sys or not config sys. So your mileage may vary, but basically it took a long, long time, like maybe 15 minutes before this this screen came up, which is actually what I want to see. And yeah, I love that. I love, I, I forgot all about the fact that Microsoft used to put these things that they say laptop minimum specifications. So like if you had a laptop, obviously, and you, you had a small hard drive and you needed to adjust it the minimum specs, it, it's the typical, which we're all familiar with. But we'll go for a complete custom and see what happens again this might mean a whole bunch of waiting it might mean the applications crashed i just don't know but you know it it's obvious that these applications were never designed to run on hard drives which are gigabytes big so it might just be you know looking through you know a hard drive which is gigs big here and just going right i'm gonna have to index every file or it could be that it's just broken anyway um i'll let it do its thing and hopefully it gets to the next stage and installs the application. After probably only a minute and a half or so, it um, decided that this bit would come up, which is exactly what I was expecting. So I think that's uh, for a full installation of Microsoft Word 6, um, which has got graph, equation, word art, profiling tools, wizards, templates, online online help. By the way, online back in those days, I think just meant it was like part of the application. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it being on the, the net or anything like that. Clip art as well. So with everything installed there, it's going to come to a massive 40 megabytes. So this goes to show the amount of application software you could get back in the day, um, you know, in such a small amount of space. I mean, it, the, the clip art, if you remove that and you remove the, um, I don't know, graphing equation and word art, you know, you're down to 30 megabytes. So really all the stuff that you could ever want and probably more, I mean like seven megs on converters, filters and data access probably wouldn't want that either. Um, you know, you're starting to get down to, you know, 23 megabytes. Um, for, for the whole of Microsoft Word. If you look at that today, I mean, I don't know what it is for the whole of Microsoft Word, but it's it's got to be probably gigabytes. It's, it's not it's not going to be um, megabytes, um, or at least if it is megabytes, it's high megabytes. But there you go. Um, just really interesting to see this, um, this old application um, running in a fully 64-bit environment and running the setup wizard. And, and, you know, it looks like it might actually be installing. Interestingly enough, I noticed there, I don't know if you saw it, but when it was saying where the location it was going to install all of the items, it actually pointed out the full 8x3 file descriptor. So I actually noticed it wasn't C colon backslash winward. It, it noticed it was sql backslash users backslash blah 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 so um it, it it's sort of a hybrid 
redirection of things going on here. It's it's um it's obviously cleverer than um than just being a fully virtualized application. It sort of knows a little bit about what's going on between the two systems. Certainly, it, I guess it. I don't know if how it believes it's being presented to the system, but it certainly is interesting. Um, <laughs> I've got this pop up, which is outside of the setup wizard, which is really, <laughs> which is really weird. Um, to, to first of all get it outside of the usual dialog box, because usually everything came up inside that blue screen. So this came out um, just here, if you saw that. But it says help for WordPerfect users can be available when you press WordPerfect command keys. Um, would you like to activate this? No, I would not. I'm not a WordPerfect user. I never was. I, I used um, my first proper word processor was um, called PFS First Choice. Um, and it was a kind of um, multi, it was kind of like Microsoft Works, way before Microsoft Works, if you remember Works. Um, but it had, um, I think it was a spreadsheet. It had a sort of database, a very, very simplistic one, like like a card file sort of thing. Um, I want to say it had a graphing thing, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it had some sort of graphing thing. And it also had the word processor. And I think the word processor was the main sort of uh, tool. And it also had a comms suite as well. I remember that. And I was thinking, what's comms? But um, I think that was like for facts and like just general data transfer. So if the other person on the other end of a modem had um, PFS first choice, they could receive, transmit and receive uh, the documents. And the doc, the, they actually made documents in .doc file format, which was a completely different .doc file format from Word, which was becoming uh, known by the time PFS first choice was popular. So. Um, yeah, the, so the competing things, I guess there was a few products at that point in time. There was quite a lot of word processors, but PFS was was found on quite a lot of machines. PFS first choice was was on the hard drive. I remember of my first XT PC. Uh, there was um, Ami Pro, um, and I first experienced that when I was um, running Windows three point one because that was bundled with a Packard Bell, which I had. And then there was WordPerfect, WordStar, I think, WordStar. Um, and and of course, Microsoft Word. So there was a few. Um, right, okay. So finally, you see, it's a second, every dialogue that it goes through, it takes a while to go through. So obviously, it looks like it's sort of going through stuff like maybe the Windows registry. I don't know what it's going through, but it's going through um, something that takes a long time every single time it goes through a, a, a section. What is really, really intriguing here is that it's found all of the, what, what were called program groups, but if you remember Windows 3.x, um, everything was like in the program manager and it was a program group. And so you, you can categorize all your apps into in program groups. And obviously these are just areas in the start menu now in Windows 10 which um, you denote, denote like sort of, I guess, areas. So all of these things are, these generations of things are actually being brought forward even as far as Windows 10. Program groups can still be derived by a Windows 3.x style application and said, oh yeah, well, a program group actually means something even in your start menu. So it the, the logic still exists. And I'm guessing that Microsoft have made it that way for backwards compatibility. So even even now they're still thinking, you know, okay, you might run an application that somehow has some relation to program groups. So we'll just make sure that that program group thing can still be accessed. And it's basically just relating to what they're called inside the start menu. So it's interesting. Um, so I have Microsoft Office for Windows well, Windows 10 installed on this machine already. And I'm hoping that these can be installed side by side and not pooch each other. Um, so I'm not going to install, I don't know if it makes any difference, but I'm not going to install it in a program group called Microsoft Office because I think I've already got Microsoft Office. And if, if I was to go into there, um, then I think that could be a problem. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna not call it, I'm just gonna call it Microsoft Word 6, right? And see if, um, 
yeah, not use that existing group. Okay, checking for necessary disk space. I know it's every action that takes, hey, look at that. Every action it takes, it's still mentioning this config sys. Um, but look at that, it is um, it's installing. Um, and now I just got the setup message saying it can't find disk two winward E1. Um, all right, let me look into that and I'll get right back to you. Okay, so I'm hoping that um, it's because the folder disk2 didn't exist. So what I've done is I've copied the setup folder, which is what I did. These are all disk images, um, which I downloaded from a website called WinWorld PC. And I extracted all of those disk images into one folder called setup, um, which just has, yeah, every single one of these files, right? Um, so what I've done is um, I've just literally copied that setup folder um, eight more times and called them disk, disk two, disk three, disk four, but they contain all the same files. So, uh, but I'd noticed inside the setup folder that winword.e1 underscore file does actually exist. So I'm hoping now if I press retry, it's going to find the folder disk two and we'll be back in business. Let's give it a shot. Yay, <laughs> there it goes. Um, I love this, uh, the these sort of things saying that the Windows Word art kind of text, and I love the features that it's telling us about bullets and numbering. I mean, wow, bullets and numbering is a big deal. Clip art as well, like I just remember getting CDs, actually, I think CDs, when, when, when I first got my CD-ROM drive, I mean, it was, it was a CD-ROM, it was a four-speed CD-ROM, um, it wasn't even an IDE one. It was a Atapi. Some I can't remember what it was, but look at this drag and drop as well. Sheesh. Anyway, um, yeah, and it would c contain all this clip art. It was just amazing. Mail merge. I remember learning how to do mail merge when I was at college. Um, that was really interesting. Get the look you want for your tables and wizards as well. Wizards was this sort of thing that, um, like obviously everybody knows what a wizard now. It just takes you through step by step, but. Um, you know, it was a new concept um, for for Windows um, 3.x, really, I think. Um, you know, drag and drop and all that sort of stuff, OLE too, that was all very new as well. That was like cutting edge at the time. So, yeah, that would have been really, really quite something. Here we go. Head up is updating your system. This is exciting. It's either, either that or it's going to completely trash my Windows 10 system, um, which unfortunately for me is my daily driver. Um, <laughs> so let's let's hope that's not going to be the case. I know that things are flickering in Windows 10 quite a lot. You can't see that because it's just off screen out of the capture area because I've got a large um, desktop area here. But the start menu, the, the actual Windows 10 start menu, is um has flickered about four times here which is rather unnerving that um changes i'm making inside what i would have considered a virtual environment are making changes to my real system um which just goes to show what i was saying earlier is probably true there is some level of interaction between the real environment and this sort of virtualized setup it's not as virtualized as um something like virtual box which is basically the operating system that you're running in believes it is its own machine. It is literally a virtual machine and it thinks it's running on bare metal. And the, the two really don't interact. The, the host operating system and the guest operating system really don't interact very much at all. They, they stay quite separate and let, uh, other than things like uh, copy and paste. And those are um, created by a hybrid uh, network and, and you can share resources like network cards and so forth as well but that's all done by the abstraction layer and the APIs between the, the host which is things like VirtualBox, or KVM, um, Hyper-V of course, um, all of those sort of technologies so they're quite separate whereas I feel like this here is talking to the bare metal much more than a virtualized system is and I think that's kind of the way that Wine worked. If I remember the little bits about wine that I I kind of remember from wine is um yeah wine wine is pretty old now I think wine has been around for a very very long time because I remember wanting to run Microsoft 
Windows applications in Red Hat Linux when I first went over to Linux. And I've got the feeling that that would have been about the turn of the millennia. So we're talking 1999, 2000 here. So hopefully I'm right that, that Wine was around um, even as far back as, you know, like the, the 90s. Um, so people in Windows and Linux could operate Windows based applications. So yeah, um, it's it's thinking about things again. Um, hopefully this is going to finish. Now is a good time to remind you whilst this is doing whatever it is doing, if it is doing anything, um, not to subscribe to Al's Geek Lab. Here we go. Um, I've got a, it says unable to create item in program group. Microsoft Word 6 item Word README help. Not too fussed about that, thank you. But more importantly, it has installed what appears to be in in a start menu. You see, see how I was saying this integration? I mean, I was guessing. I was pretty sure I was right. But you can see here that it has created a start menu entry programs Microsoft Word 6. So pro, Microsoft Word word dialogue edit or whatever that did and word setup i'm assuming which is this this very application the same thing um but isn't that great it's cool oh, it's actually made it within the start menu so i should be able to now go into start menu and i can and the cool little retro icons are there that is so wicked i'm just yeah that's really funny that's so cool so yeah successfully installed and i believe this is a windows NT 3.5 application as opposed to Windows 3.x, but operationally, I think the applications were pretty much the same. So it says it needs to restart the whole machine, and that's exactly what it would have done in the old days. I don't know if it will do that. If I press continue, is it going to reboot this whole machine? If it does, um, I'll be back. <laughs> huh? It wants to shut down Windows. <laughs> Um, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shut down windows. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be, I'm just I'm going to wing it and see if word springs to life. Um, because I expected that it might just spring to life. And what do you know? There it is in all its glory. So that was a fully comprehensive installation of Microsoft Word 6, um, which is just, um, Pretty, pretty awesome actually um, because you know I could I could understand it being able to run simple uh, so when I say it I'm referring to the um, the uh, wine e wine DV uh, VDM wine VDM not win EVDM um, application so um, it, yeah it's great I, I can understand it being able to do small 16-bit applications and just running an exe file or an exe file with a dll and stuff like that um but to actually be able to install all the way through the install wizard and then present it to a windows system a windows 10 system in the start menu uh, that that itself is pretty cool um and then just you know just seeing it and all it's windows 3.x glory and and it looks looks just like it was i love this um houghton mifflin company um correct text which is a spell checker um i i love that that just brings back member uh, memories of dunder mifflin which was the paper company in the office if you remember the office uh tv so series and um yeah so they licensed all of this software they didn't actually make their own spell checker at that point in time uh, the Saurus was um, from SoftArt. Um, all that sort of stuff, really cool. 1993. So that's when this, version's, this version came out. Um, and uh, it obviously started in 1983. So that's very cool. Um, I just pressed System Info. I think that was a big mistake. Because <laughs> um, I think when you did System Info, it would bring up it would make some DLL calls, some API calls to uh, Windows 3.x or, or in this case, Windows NT. But it, it did. It, <laughs> wow, it brought it up. 
That's so cool. Um, it did take a wee while there, as you saw, but look at this. This is cool. It reckons I'm running DOS 5 with Windows version 3.95. So I, I don't even know what 3.95 is. Was there a version of Windows NT called 3.19? I don't think so. Um, 3.86 enhanced, yeah, okay. I, I kind of get how it believes that. It believes I'm not running, it means I'm not running in real mode, not on a Windows 2 style machine. Um, with a 486 processor, I guess there was nothing better than a 486 at the time. Uh, I believe I've got a co-processor. I've got, what's that? 100 meg, is that 100 megabytes? No, yeah. 100 megabytes of RAM. 99% <laughs> resources free. Total conventional memory 640k. I don't even know where it's getting this information from. This is so weird. Um, just all seeing all this. This is cool. Um, printing. Oh wow. Now that is really cool. That was wonder that was I was I was actually wondering about that. I was wondering if it was going to pick up the printer and be able to print to the real printer. So my that is my actual Windows 10 printer, the Brother 3040 there, um, which is insane. So I'm going to try and actually um, that's a little hat tip to one of my favorite um, uh, channels. I won't say which. And um, Hello from Al's Geek Lab. All right, Control P works as well. Control P, print to brother thirty four. This is this is and and printer on NE zero three. I don't even know what NE zero three is, but this I'm just gonna press OK and see what happens. If I hear a printer kicking in, which is through the room, it's it's uh, way through there. I'm just gonna have a look and see if it's like. If it's in the queue, it, it blooming well is, <laughs> and I could I just heard the printer kick in in the other room. That's so crazy! Wow, that is awesome. I love it. And if I go to open a document, does it bring up um, the file manager? Um, I'm guessing this is going to take a little while. I think this is the sort of same operation. Whatever it is that it takes a while to do whatever it is to, to, I guess it has to index files or something like that, but it does seem every time it touches the file system, it takes some time, but there you go. Um, and it did install it into what it thinks is C colon win word. Um, let's just have a look at the virtual C drive. Okay. So the virtual C drive is in downloads OT VDM. And it hasn't placed WinWord in there, so I'm guessing it's actually placed it into WinWord. Indeed it has. Right there. Okay. All right. Look at this. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it worked. I cannot believe that. That's so awesome. Um, yeah, the paper, by the way, is dodgy because my printer is dodgy. My printer is very, very old and, and definitely needs replacing. So there you go. Um, I love it. I think this this is great. So I can go literally, yeah, yeah, I can go into, like, this is the actual Windows directory. So this is the, so it is actually accessing the real C drive. This is not the, this is not a virtual drive or anything like that. It's actually accessing the C drive. So I thought I would take a moment off camera to fire up my old DOS machine, which you might even be able to hear in the background. It's very noisy. The fan in it is not obviously as well oiled as it used to be. Um, but I wanted to see if I could write a document and in Word 6 for DOS and then take it across um, as is pretty much to uh, Windows uh, for Windows DOS, Windows, Word for Windows version 6. That was what I was going for. Um, so let's just, um, first of all, here it is in the File Explorer. 
Um, you'll notice that I've, this is, um, if you look at one of my other videos, um, which I'll try and remember to link to, please remind me to link to it if I've forgotten. But um, I've got another video showing you how to use a thing called EtherServe and EtherDFS, which basically allows you to share files via a Raspberry Pi using, yeah, Linux basically and Samba to share files between the Windows environment and the DOS environment. So this is basically like a junction box on the network that shares files um, just as if they were a, as a mapped network drive in Windows and in DOS. So I can literally go onto my DOS machine in Word, go onto what I've mapped as the X drive and see all the files that I've shared to my Windows environment and vice versa. It's all running on Linux. But as you can see here, I have, um, I have three files actually. Um, I started off as um, as as it um, with um, with a Word document, or sorry, a text document, like a rich text document. I think I was trying to do it in rich text or some for some reason. I think probably because I was having conversion issues and I wanted to bring it across to um, to Windows, and that's kind of why this this issue. But if you see, so what I've got first of all is. Um, here, uh, Windows uh, Office 365 Word, okay? Office 365 Word, yeah, no no Windows. Uh, and you get the option to import it. And this is the doc, doc file. And you can get the option of using MS-DOS, Windows, or other encoding, and I'll say DOS. And when you open it, um, basically, Word says no. That's, that's it, it recognizes the file is there, but it will refuse to open it, even though it can sort of half read it. Um, you can then get a text document, and of course you can get things like WordPad um, or Notepad to read it. Um, but then I thought, uh, let's let's try and um, get it to save it in a in a Word for Windows format, and you can get you get this. You're attempting to open a file. Uh, that has been blocked by all your trust contents. And I, I, I'm assuming that maybe you could go into the trust center in Word and, um, and maybe unblock it. But again, it's probably not, um, not ideal. So if I go into Word 6 now, little tip of the day. Oh, nice. Uh, if I go in here and file open, I change my drive from the C drive to the network share, which you can see the little network share icon there, to Z drive, and I just go into the appropriate folder, and then there's these two here. Now, interestingly enough, when I try to open this one here, it says can't open the converter worddos.cnv. I don't know why that is, but it has a hard time opening the DOS uh, file. So in Word for DOS 6, what I did is I saved it um, as a Windows format. So rather than Word for DOS, I saved it as Windows 2 format for Word Word for Windows 2 format. Okay. And then I called it script w.doc. So I'll just open that. And then as you can see, I mean, it's perfect. Um, you can see that it's a, you know, a, uh, a word doc um, because you know it's got bold for example and underline and all that sort of stuff I didn't actually bother putting any other formatting in it but you can see that you know that's my script I've written on the DOS machine and all the you know the appropriate formatting is all is all there and you know the tab stop is completely correct it's at um, you know 15 and a half inches for a4 so you know that that looks ideal. So there you have it, Microsoft Word 6.0 on Windows. Um, it's actually pretty sophisticated, but it, you know, look, it's got like um, OLE objects that dynamically update and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, if you were to actually use this version of Word, this version 6, of Word that was brought out in, you know, 1993. If you were to use that in this day and age, it would probably do 99% of the things that you actually want. I mean, even the one I've got over there for DOS, 
does things that I still can't do in uh, Office 365 for web, which is like insert a table of contents and stuff. I can do that in Docs, which is just mental. Um, so this is this is a really good version of of Word. To be honest with you, it does everything I need and and probably more. Like I don't know, there's not many times I need graphs in my Word Docs, but you know I can do that as well. So uh, I just thought that that would be it was a really interesting. Um, demonstration obviously to show you both what I can do. I can transfer documents from my old MS-DOS machine over flawlessly. I can print them off and I can obviously run 16, any almost by the, by the looks of it, pretty much any 16-bit binary on a Windows 10 machine and it seems to work pretty well. So there you go. That's the kind of that's the kind of wrap up for you. I um, I hope you've enjoyed this particular Owl's Geek Lab. Um, I, it's just one of those ones that I kind of threw together. As you can probably tell, there's no preparation. Um, it's just uh, just one of those kind of things that I just kind of stream. Um, if you enjoy the content of this particular video, then you'll probably enjoy the content of my other videos. There's lots of content which is actually uh, much more scripted, much more um, well done than this particular one um, so check him out um, and if you like them then please give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to the channel and I know how uh, sort of cliche that sounds because every single youtuber asks for that but there is a good reason and I don't know if that reason is always explained and the reason is because the YouTube algorithm starts recommending it to other people who might like this sort of content too and before you know it, you know, the content of this channel and, and other related channels all become sort of intermeshed and it gets recommended to other people who might like the channel too. And then you might get recommended to other channels as well that are kind of like following me and we're all kind of in this little ecosystem of doing stuff that's retro computing and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, it will do you a favor, but it'll also do me a favor and everybody wins, right? So thumbs up, please. Uh, subscribe and press the notification bell to set to all so you get to know about all my new videos coming out. Um, thank you very much for watching. I will see you again very soon here on Al's Geek Lab.